Uh, my name is Amy Wendt, and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research for the Physical Sciences. And it is my sincere privilege uh, to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Leah Shanley is currently the Executive Director, CEO, and President of the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley, California, a nonprofit research institute focused on advancing today as a finalist for the position of Director of the American Family Insurance Data Science Institute at UW-Madison. Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay, I'm having internet instability, so hopefully I can hang in here for another minute. So the, uh, the DSI was established as a center under the administration of the UW-Madison Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research and Graduate Education in 2019. The mission of the DSI is to perform cutting edge research in fundamental data science to translate this research by partnering with key application areas and to collaborate with researchers across academic divisions to advance scientific discovery. I'm delighted to share that Dr. Shanley earned a PhD in environmental uh, in, in, sorry, in Environment and Resources from the Nelson Institute at UW-Madison, and also very recently served as a Nelson Institute Fellow. Um, Dr. Stanley has <laughs> data science in a variety of contexts through both academic and government leadership positions, including um, as the executive director of the NSF South Big Data Innovation Hub, as director of the Commons Lab in the Wilson Center, as a fellow of the National Academies, as a White House Presidential Innovation Fellow in the NASA Office of the Chief Technologist. So I look forward to hearing more about her own experiences and her thoughts about data science at UW-Madison. And uh, just a couple technical things before we get started. Um, uh, we'll have a 45-minute uh, presentation followed by 15 minutes for question and answer. And you can either use the hand raising feature in Zoom and um, uh, when you have a question and I will moderate that, or if you prefer, you can put your question in the chat and I'll be watching for that too. And lastly, in just a moment for the audience members, I'm gonna put a link um, to a website where you can provide input on our candidate and presentation. No pressure so without, <laughs> without further ado, I will pass the virtual pointer to Dr. Shanley uh, for her presentation entitled, Envisioning Data Science and the Wisconsin Idea at UW-Madison. So welcome, Dr. Shanley. Well, thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. Uh, there we go. Okay, Oop, let me if I can. Okay. Wonderful. So good afternoon and thank you for inviting me. I greatly appreciate your giving me this opportunity to share my background and interest in the AFI Data Science Institute. Next slide. I'm trying. Just give me a moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I'm going to cover a little bit about my background and uh, my research uh, portfolio, future challenges, and perhaps uh, some, you know, initial thoughts on vision and implementation. Next slide. So I think of myself as a pracademic or a non-traditional academic. Over the past two decades, uh, my professional career has focused on a few things, both conducting and facilitating interdisciplinary research, uh, managing programs, building and supporting research communities, translating complex scientific uh, research for policymakers, and driving organizational change. Um, I started my career as a physicist. Um, my master's degree focused on analyzing Hubble Space Telescope UV and ROSAT X-ray satellite observations 
of the X-ray nova called GQ Musk, which in English means the fly, kind of like Jeff Goldblum. Uh, but then I was lured over to the UW Environmental Remote Sensing Center, uh, which needed folks with physics and math skills uh, who could analyze satellite imagery of the Earth. And as it happened, my background in stellar atmospheres served me well in Steve Ackerman's class, uh, where we had to remove the clouds from satellite imagery. Uh, so as a grad student in UW-Nelson, I was excited to apply my technical and analytical skills in geographic, sorry, geographic information science to problems of the real world, uh, to real world relevance under the Wisconsin idea, right, in the service of our state and the citizens of Wisconsin. And so that included applications in agriculture, disaster response, natural resource management, and community development. I also worked as part of a small leadership team under the state cartographer and the state geographic information officer uh, in the Department of Administration to build broad consensus for and implement a governance model for statewide GIS coordination council uh, to, to build geospatial and earth observation capacity within the state. Um, but in 2009, uh, I was encouraged to apply for and was awarded an American Association for the Advancement of Science Congressional Science Fellowship to spend a year in Congress as a science advisor, and in this case, uh, to work with Senator Bill Nelson from Florida, who at the time was chair of the Science and Space Subcommittee in the Senate. Landing in Congress at the beginning of a new administration, so that, you know, Obama was just elected, uh, and when they were trying to pass a stimulus package uh, was a whirlwind, uh, but it was also a great learning experience. I had the opportunity to serve as the science, primary science advisor to the senator on new satellite systems like NPOS, GOZAR, DISCOVER, and the Jason satellite missions, as well as the instruments they carried. Uh, but often it was, you know, Shanley's a scientist, go ask her. So I had to learn everything from marine mammals to free electron lasers, <laughs> research parks, and everything in between. Uh, it allowed me to work on several pieces of legislation related to federal R&D, uh, and in each case, I had to learn the science behind each of those bills, uh, including drafting uh, language for the Earth Science Section of the 2010 NASA Authorization Act. Uh, so there was, at the time, each agency, NOAA, NASA, USGS, made decisions internally about what satellite missions and instruments that they would launch. Um, and there wasn't really a consideration for what were the national priorities. So the language that I researched and uh, drafted for the NASA reauthorization was mandating one of the first national civil earth observation strategies and implementation plans. Our intent, one, was to prioritize and address gaps in climate observations, but two, to really make it a whole of government approach and also to make sure that the agencies, NASA, NOAA, and USGS and others reached out to the broader stakeholder communities, the research community, for example, or the disaster response community. What instruments, what missions did they want to see? Subsequently, uh, I was then recruited to become director of the uh, Commons Lab at the Wilson Center in Washington, DC, which is a research think tank. Uh, I led a team of researchers, grad students, uh, and visiting scholars to produce 19 studies exploring the technical and policy challenges related to social computing, crowdsourcing, and citizen science for application areas in disaster response, humanitarian relief, and environmental monitoring. So in 2011, maybe some of you remember, we had the Haitian earthquake hit. It sparked a wild west of volunteer crowdsourcing groups, agencies like FEMA and the State Department wanted to know how could they use this new technology, these new methodologies, how could they safely integrate crowdsource data and use it with our authoritative data sets? So we began to do some training sessions, began to pull together five federal colleagues who I knew had interest or expertise in this area over a box of cookies. And we discussed approaches that we could take to build capacity within the government. And ultimately that led to my co-founding the Federal Community of Practice around crowdsourcing and citizen science which as I said, we started with five or six people and has now grown to over 400 federal staff across 60 federal departments. But I can only go so far at a research institution and in order to take my research to action, I was recruited and then awarded for a White House Presidential Innovation Fellowship, uh, working in 2014, 2015, closely with the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, 
but being in residence at NASA in their office of the chief technologist. So it was an incredible experience working with NASA where astronauts walk the halls regularly. Uh, but I was, that allowed me to take the recommendations that we had developed in our research, to take those research findings and those recommendations and actually put them into action. So as part of a small leadership team, uh, you know, led by the White House, we were able to mobilize 124 federal staff to build and launch a step-by-step how-to toolkit, uh, catalog of projects, and, and other resources that helped enable federal scientists to use these new computational and uh, uh, citizen science approaches. Um, I used the AAAS Fellows Network to reach out to Senator Kuhn's office and was able to set up some briefings with them about the research findings, about the regulatory challenges related to our work. And this led to legislation that was passed and incorporated as part of the Competes Act renewal in 2016. So my chair and I, to, to cap that off, also helped to shape or <laughs> ghost author a White, Ho White House memorandum on crowdsourcing and citizen science that was released by the President's Science Advisor, John Holdren in 2015, and that one encouraged agencies to use these new technologies and approaches, and also provided mechanisms for greater federal wide coordination of this research. So, you know, that was more than enough excitement for me. And right before the change of administration, uh, I was recruited uh, for the position of co-executive director, inaugural co-executive director for the National Science Foundation's South Big Data Innovation Hub, uh, the role of which was to catalyze and strengthen cross-sector partnerships that advance data science research to address regional and national challenges. So in this capacity, I worked with about 52 research teams across 16 states in the Southeast, helping them to get access to data, cloud and cyber infrastructure and other resources and expertise to advance their work. In 2020, however, I was uh, recruited to lead the International Computer Science Institute in Berkeley, California. We are a nonprofit institute, as Amy mentioned, uh, with about 48 researchers and staff focus on advancing computer science and data science research. Uh, with consideration of international collaboration. So we have research scholars from all over the world come to our institute. We are independent from, but closely affiliated with Berkeley the past 30 years. We were founded by Berkeley faculty and many of our researchers have joint appointments. Um, and so we do a lot of research collaboration with the different institutes on campus, including the Berkeley Institute of Data Science. Next slide. So I was asked to touch briefly on my management style, uh, having been trained in participatory action research at the University of Wisconsin, my leadership style is one that's very participatory. Um, I like to engage a broad range of stakeholders uh, in the process of consideration for making certain decisions. Um, my core values are in excellence, innovation, honesty and integrity, diversity and inclusion, which is a big priority, authenticity and transparency. And so as a UW alum, I was very much steeped in the um, Wisconsin idea, you know, the idea of uh, the research and education on campus is directed at solving problems that are relevant to the citizens of Wisconsin and our country. And this philosophy has guided me throughout my entire career. Next slide. Next slide. So as a geospatial information scientist and as someone who's helped to advance the field of crowdsourcing, uh, I have applied my technical and analytical skills to a wide range of domains uh, from natural and resource management, agriculture, disaster management, environmental factors of health, and more. I've also worked at the intersection of technology, social science, and policy, conducting and facilitating research in data privacy and ethics, indigenous data sovereignty, and social cybersecurity. Next slide. One of my research threads, oh, whoop, there we go. One of my research threads has focused on what is now called indigenous data sovereignty. I collaborated with four American Indian tribes across the US, including one in Wisconsin, to study the technical, policy, and ethical challenges related to tribal spatial data privacy, ownership, and sovereignty in the context of the federal tribal trust relationship, proposing both technical and policy strategies for addressing those risks. Next slide. 
So I'm going to give you guys a bit of background because I find that a lot of folks haven't worked with tribes before and don't understand necessarily or have been familiar with the kind of complex institutional and legal framework that tribes are operating under. Uh, there are 574 federally recognized tribes in the US, uh, as well as many state recognized tribes. Tribes, however, are not another ethnic or special interest group. They are, in fact, distinct independent political communities. This political relationship is based on the treaties and other legal agreements, on United States federal Indian law, and on international human rights law. So tribal governments, as well as tribal grassroots groups, tribal colleges, tribal corporations, they all create, maintain, and disseminate data and satellite imagery as part of their day-to-day -day government and business activities. In addition, the Bureau of Indian Affairs under the Department of Interior administers more than 55 million acres of land held in trust by the federal government on behalf of tribes and Alaska natives. And so as you can imagine, there's a lot of data generated about that land and water and resources. And through the government to government relationship, the BIA and other executive agencies have a trust responsibility towards tribes. They also have a duty to consult tribal governments regarding proposed federal policies and actions that have tribal implications. These agencies create, maintain, disseminate information, spatial data, satellite imagery, as part of this consultation, sorry, consultation process, as well as you all as researchers might interact with the tribe uh, and be collecting data on the reservation and about tribal communities. Next slide. So issues emerge over data ownership, access, control, and privacy. So I'm going to cover a couple of few core concepts here. Uh, tribes, one, have inherent powers of self-government over their reservations and trust lands, just like states do. Uh, just like states, they can act their own, enact their own statutes that govern data access, implementing tribal open records laws or privacy laws, for example. Um, and they have a government-to-government -government relationship with the government. Um, as part of that process, uh, they share data with the federal government. And it then becomes accessible under the Freedom of Information Act, or they share data with researchers, and then that data gets out into the wild. Well, why why is that a, a, a problem? Next slide. So, based on America's history of sorry, colonialization, systemic racism, marginalization, American Indian tribes have long been concerned about who can access, control, interpret their information data about their lands resources, communities, and, and members of their tribe. So while misuse of data uh, ha has been a longstanding concern, recent federal and state court decisions, the development of data science, and now sophisticated high resolution satellite imagery uh, has really raised this issue to the forefront. So as at tribal meetings and conferences, I often hear concerns about helicopter researchers that come in to the reservation, take tribal knowledge and data without giving anything back. Um, they're concerned about access for a few reasons. Uh, one, it's resulted, uh, you know, the data being shared with third parties has resulted in a reduced bargaining power for tribes when negotiating leases with companies uh, for tribal timber, rangeland, oil and gas, minerals, resulting in lower economic returns. It's affected their ability to assist, solve, um, to enforce air and water quality regulations. It's uh, impacted their ability to defend their water rights, their hunting and fishing treaty rights, and it's infringed on their collective sense of privacy, particularly unwanted intrusion of tourists or tribal sacred sites, destruction of sacred sites, and theft of cultural artifacts. So there's some fundamental issues at right here, underpinning the technical work, tribes' rights and interests in their knowledge, data, and resources, federal agencies' authority and decision-making that affect those resources, and the public's right to know. So it's a fairly complex situation. Um, and so as researchers, when we go in and work with tribal communities or work with data that affects tribes, so say of a national park, we have to be mindful of these data ethics, uh, sorry, uh, data science studies issues. Next slide. This brings me to the concept of indigenous data sovereignty and indigenous data governance. So the right of indigenous peoples and nations to govern the collection, ownership, and application of data. Next slide. My research specifically did a deep investigation into the technical challenges. So for example, masking of data, um, data handling policies, 
uh, and technical strategies, as well as looking at some of the legal and social science or organizational issues related to this. Um, so I'm not going to get into the weeds of that today, um, but ultimately tribes uh, would encourage them to ensure tribal government transparency and access to the data for tribal citizens, while at the same time combining a creative combination of technical, legal and policy organizational solutions to make sure that that data isn't exploited by third parties. And secondly, and most importantly, perhaps, is really building internal capacity to understand and use data science and spatial data technologies to tribes own advantage. And so I have a colleague, uh, Joseph Robertson, who's um, a Native American uh, data scientist, who says that data science is the new frontier of self-determination. Next slide. And I'm really excited to see now, after 20 years, uh, that the care principles are now being coupled with the FAIR principles for data access. So being mindful when we're using research data of who it might impact and how to handle it appropriately. And now I'm participating in an IEEE working group on data provenance for indigenous data sovereignty. Next slide. So another area in which I've worked is around crowdsourcing and citizen science uh, and closely related in social computing. Uh, Machine learning, artificial intelligence, and deep learning have advanced significantly over the past decade. Nonetheless, humans, uh, we possess a unique ability such as creativity, context and abstraction, analytical problem solving, and detecting unusual events. So to successfully tackle some of the critical scientific and societal challenges, we need not only machines or machine learning, but also those unique human capabilities. And we can accelerate this research through the integration of both citizen science crowdsourcing and these new data science approaches. Next slide. So colleagues and I recently co-authored a research brief for the Computing Community Consortium, outlining what we saw as the core research challenges at the intersection of citizen science and machine learning. So to seize those opportunities, fundamental research is going to be needed in how to best configure this human machine teaming Specifically, research is needed in real-time data processing, detecting rare events, and improving data quality. So what do I mean by that? So citizen science is providing uh, a proving ground for adaptive systems that leverage both humans and machines to process live sensor data in near real time. In particular, important gains can be made through research coupling citizen science use of AI on the edge. That is, if we had, say, installed a pre-trained model on the sensors to filter data, and recording only those instances pertinent to the citizen science task. Gains also can be made through research into AI systems or machine learning systems that can integrate heterogeneous data flows from citizen science deployed sensors. The second research area, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, the second research area uh, is detecting rare events. So uh, machine learning AI systems can improve by learning from human analysis by referring uncertain cases to humans for help when needed. So uh, the Green Pea Galaxy, for example, in Zooniverse, right? So uh, the algorithms weren't really picking this up. They were thinking it was just an outlier, but it was the humans, the citizen scientists that said, no, this is something we need to pay attention to. Investigating the best combination of human and machine intelligence for anomaly detection could lead to better um, scientific discoveries to improved algorithms that minimize the need for human intervention, for example, in industrial settings. The third area of research is improving data quality. The better quality and variety of data submitted by humans, the better the training data are for machine learning and AI. Research is needed into how to maximize the rigor and re sorry, reproducibility of integrated human machine citizen science projects. We also need to address the challenges of crowdsourced data provenance, attribution, bias, integrity, and verification. Next slide. A fourth priority area I would say is the growing need for research in privacy, security, and trust for citizen science and AI. For example, as we begin to rely on citizen science data to inform uh, decision-making and scientific research, we'll need to characterize and develop strategies to combat computer-mediated manipulation of volunteer behavior and data collection efforts. So kind of that disinformation, misinformation, or so social cybersecurity studies. And the potential spread of disinformation through citizen science platforms, mobile apps, and observations, like we see with Wikipedia. 
A fifth challenge is that citizen science data are scattered in small ponds across numerous projects. So there's a real challenge around the data cyber infrastructure to be able to get collect this data and aggregate up from the local and regional to the national and the global. So we need to align citizen science and crowdsourcing with open science and open data objectives. We'll need to integrate citizen science into our cloud strategies and our research cyber infrastructure strategies. Next slide. So I kind of alluded to it there, the real challenge, the grand challenge will be coordinating and scaling across these projects. So say you have a volunteer water monitoring data collection effort in Wisconsin, you've got one in North Carolina and Florida, and then you've got one in Spain. How do we begin to scale up these efforts from the local to the national to the global? And that will require cross-cutting strategies and a research agenda that includes data science. Next slide. Next slide. So I was really excited to see the definition of data science in the DSI's uh, overview. Um, it's defined data science broadly, um, which really aligns with my own thinking. Uh, with this definition, I think the American Family Insurance DSI offers an exciting opportunity that is inclusive of a broad range of research domains, departments, centers, and programs. From computer science, stats, and engineering, to physical and biological sciences, social sciences, the arts and the humanities. Next slide. So we might take a look at uh, Donald Stokes' work. In his book, Pasture's Quadrant, he presented a box divided into four quadrants that represent an emphasis on different aspects of research. Uh, it acknowledges that we have basic and applied research, but these two don't necessarily oppose each other, but can be blended to support each other. So according to Stokes, any scientist can be placed in this grid uh, relative to the importance of the two concerns in their work. Stokes maintains that many scientists work in the upper right quadrant, kind of motivated both by their curiosity for fundamental principles of nature, uh, but also the desire to contribute to the public good. Next slide. So for the AFI uh, Data Science Institute, we could consider, for example, a blended model uh, in the upper right corner of the grid, advancing both use-inspired fundamental research as well as applied research, like the Michigan Institute for Data Science, MIDAS, or the Ohio State University's Translational Analytics Institute. That said, if I were selected for this position, I would really wanna learn more about the strategic planning process that Doc, uh, Director Brian Yandel and his team have already led recently. I would really want to you know, canvas campus, uh, listening and talking to a broad range of stakeholders, departments across campus to listen and understand their interests and needs. And ideally we'd wanna foster an innovative, diverse, inclusive and responsible data science research e ecosystem within the Institute. Next slide. So I was asked to talk a little bit about research challenges and I would broad, um, bin them broadly in three broad categories. First would be AI intelligence or machine learning intelligence for science and operations. Uh, so that would include things like data and data management, such as open data, data repositories, training data sets. Uh, data cyber infrastructure is absolutely key for supporting the, the research enterprise and cloud computing. But then we get to things like transformative research and development, like quantum computing, or translational data science, which I would call AI for X. So AI for health and infectious disease, for environmental data science, uh, machine learning and, and uh, you know, digital agriculture, for example. Uh, so really taking that, uh, what we're learning in data science and advancing data science, but applying it to some of these domains. Next slide. Second, AI, economic competitiveness, and the future of work. So clearly there's a growing need for data scientists. There's a growing demand for data science professionals across government and industry, uh, but it's being challenged by a shortage of qualified candidates. And so we'll need to train the next generation of data scientists. And the DSI can play a role perhaps in providing some of that um, real world experience in the research that we do. Uh, and we'll want to also attract global talent. Uh, so it's not just folks from the US, but there are researchers all over the world that could add value to the DSI. Uh, and then very importantly, I would say we wanna emphasize a diverse and inclusive workforce in data science. Next slide. 
The third bin, I would say, is the future of democracy. You know, how do we ensure responsible and ethical AI, ensure fairness, accountability, and transparency? How do we ensure that privacy and ethics are considered? Building this ethical thinking and responsible thinking into the design and testing of algorithms and machine learning. Can we provide incentives for responsible and explainable AI to create a market? And then issues like cybersecurity and cognitive security or social cybersecurity, which is that misinformation, disinformation. Next slide. So then getting uh, a little bit closer to home in the, the DSI itself, um, how might we foster and scale a diverse and interdisciplinary da data science institute and research community on campus? Next slide. First, looking perhaps at uh, translational data science, we'll need to strengthen and greatly expand our partnerships between data scientists, domain scientists, experts, and practitioners. We'll need to support to do that approaches in open science and re reproducibility. Uh, so that includes uh, open access to journals, open access to data, software and hardware, and open collaboration like I was discussing with the crowdsourcing and participatory approaches. We'll also need to support the adoption of team science methodologies. So if we're bringing in folks from different disciplines and different uh, domains, they're all going to speak different languages and have different organizational and cultural norms in how they do research. And team science approaches, or the science of team science, allows for the development of shared understandings of how a research project is going to proceed with things like collaboration plans and authorship plans. Um, so that would be one thing we could consider. Next slide. Um, and then translational data science, I think, really aligns well with the Wisconsin idea of serving our community, serving our state, serving the nation. So advancing the Wisconsin idea, we'd want to partner with local, state, tribal, federal governments to build data science capacity, conduct research with real world impact. So examples of this are NSF's data science core, which sending students out into the real world to do uh, what you might call participatory action research using data science with local governments or state governments, nonprofits. Data Kind is another uh, effort in that uh, regard. Uh, University of Washington's uh, E-Institute has Data Science for Social Good. Uh, Southern California, for example, has the Data Science Federation, which pairs uh, students with, with governments. And of course, you've got the UW Extension, which is an amazing opportunity for practical uh, learning, you know, hands-on in the field learning of data science. Um, so we'll want to also, though, partner with private sector and nonprofit organizations in addition to AFI. One mechanism to do that is through the NSF's Midwest Big Data Hub, which is already building partnerships uh, between researchers and industry. There are other models. Uh, so whether this is not necessarily a DSI, this may be something that C CDIS does, but there's industry affiliate programs that could also be utilized. Next slide. And we also need to look at our models of collaboration. Uh, you know, pr one, providing the tools, resources, resources, software, cyber infrastructure that underpins our research endeavors, providing data repositories to really juicy data or data commons, like the Northeast Hub has a COVID data commons that we could all tap into. Uh, they're already doing, uh, the data science hubs are already doing the data and software carpentry trainings. Um, we could consider open software uh, development. Um, Jupyter Notebooks, I believe the hubs are covering some of this area. One thing we also could consider is something like a NASA Frontiers uh, lab style intensive workshop or practicum where you're working with NASA or other agencies uh, or other folks with really uh, interesting challenges and the, and the students, the grad students, undergrads can really dig their teeth into an intensive you know, deep dive doing research for a, you know, maybe six to eight week period with leading experts in the field to really begin to use their skills in the real world. And then I think science communication, uh, data storing, data storytelling, data visualization training uh, will all be very important. And whether that's CDIS or whether that's the hubs that do this, but I think that will help communicate the value of the data science approaches and the impact it's having across domains. Next slide. And then uh, within the DSI, as well as I think more broadly on campus, 
we really need to think very carefully and systematically about diversity, equity, and inclusion in data science. Um, and I would make a personal commitment to work closely with UW's HR department uh, to adopt evidence-based DEI strategies for recruiting and retention of the data science staff uh, in the Institute. Um, we could also develop a broadening participation and computing plan that the National Science Foundation is now uh, asking departments to put together and as well as some PIs are now being required as some of sizes uh, grant programs. Uh, we also could consider supporting research in the area of AI for equity and social justice. Uh, there are organizations like Black and AI, the National Consortium for Women in IT, and Environmental Data, Data Science Inclusion Network that also have resources and support networks that would help us build uh, diversity and equity and inclusion into our, our research agenda and programs. Um, in my own institute, I have an advisory council uh, of PIs uh, that help inform my decision making and how to run the institute. I know the DSI has a council that includes faculty and some external members. I think that's fabulous. Um, also having all hands meetings on a regular basis to communicate, you know, what's going on at the DSI level, but also to get input and make it a much more participatory and brainstorming process. And then something that I've uh, done a lot of in my career and think is really important is creating research communities of practice around data science. And so, for example, when I was in uh, DC um, around the crowdsourcing and open innovation approaches, you know, you might have one person in NASA and one person in health and human services and another person in the Federal Communications Commission trying to use these approaches in isolation in their stovepipes. So how do we connect these nodes? How do we connect these champions of these new approaches so that they can share expertise, lessons learned, develop best practices together? So a peer-to-peer -peer network, and that could be across campus or it could be internally within a department. But as a DSI and as the hub and partnership, we could help seed some of those networks. Next slide. And I also think it's important to couple the technical with the data science studies. And so Berkeley, for example, has been doing this. And I think as well, OSU's uh, Translational uh, Analytics Institute is what are the values we wanna put forward in our data science research? And then also we want to develop socially and ethically responsible data scientists and domain research innovators. And we also perhaps wanna support research and critical theory around data science. So that would be something for the science and technology studies and the iSchool folks and other folks in, in different social science departments that we could um, you know, partner with around this research. Lastly, <laughs> next slide. Um, we really would love to see to expand our horizons as one dean I talked to says, yeah, you're landlocked, right, in the Midwest. And how do you reach the East Coast and the West Coast and the donors there and the companies there and the you know other potential partners? Well, one way is participation through national research associations or international research associations. So I've listed just a few, but there are many, many more that we could consider. Of course, the Computing Research Association and the Computing Community Consortium, the new Academic Data Science Alliance that rose up out of the more Sloan data science environment is a phenomenal place to get connected to folks who are running data science institutes uh, at their universities across the country. They now have a data science leadership summit that I, when I was at the hub, helped to launch. Uh, it's like Snowbird for computer scientists, but it's bringing together the heads of all the research institutes in data science to talk about strategic direction and lessons learned and you know recruitment. And then I mentioned the big data hubs. And of course, there's a national AI initiative. And plugging into that, you could have real impact on federal investments in machine learning and AI research. And then internationally, there's the Research Data Alliance. And then there's some organizations, for example, in Europe and intergovernmental organizations that are all looking at uh, how to advance machine learning and AI and data science research. So last slide. With that, I'd say let's move forward with data science.
Can everybody hear me? I'd like to um, I'd like to invite you all to join me in thank you thanking Dr. Shanley for her excellent presentation. <laughs> And with that, I, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, you can either use the hand raising feature or um, type your question into the chat window. And so Lee, I'll, I'll start one off while other people um, think, about, think about it. So you, you talked about a, a collaboration a bunch and you clearly had a lot of examples where you've developed and participated uh, in those types of activities. Mm -hmm. what, what do you see as the biggest challenge when you develop and establish a collaboration? I think one of the biggest challenges with data science, uh, particularly when you're working across domains is, as I had mentioned in my slides, the difference in cultures, in, in scientific cultures. So, for example, in the Big Data Hub, I, myself and my colleagues tried to bring together hydrologists and bioatmospheric researchers with data scientists. And the hydrologists were mid to late career. They had their own jargon for their research. The data scientists are often early career. Their master's level, perhaps not necessarily PhD, they're not faculty. So there's a different in hierarchy, there's a different in domain knowledge. You know, the, the hydrologists are, their models are based on the you know, physical world, on physics. Uh, the, the data scientists, they're looking at the data, not necessarily tied to the reality in the real, real world, that, you know, the, the theory. Um, so, and they have different cultures. And so it was sometimes hard, they'd be talking past each other. And so creating a space, knowing that that's going to happen, creating a space of a couple days at the beginning of any of these, you know, collaboration meetings to let them begin to get to familiar with each other and, and how they do research and to understand each other's jargon and also encourage them to speak in plain language because they're all PhD or, you know, brilliant people, but they don't know each other's jargon. And so, you know, it's something as simple as that, I think, can really facilitate the other piece I mentioned in my talk is team science approaches. Um, I think, again, when you're coming from dis different disciplines, for example, uh, some disciplines, it's automatically assumed that the head of a lab is going to be the first author. In other disciplines, it's he's at the end of the or she is at the end of the, the authorship. And so a collaboration plan might clearly articulate from the beginning what the expectations are of the roles and responsibilities of the different contributors. Uh, so that there's clarity at the beginning. And then, of course, you can, uh, you know, along the way, update that as needed. And so I've, I've really been digging into the science of team science, and there's a professional association um, focused on that. My colleague, Steve Fiore at University of Central Florida, has particularly been looking at the role of team science and data science and how that might facilitate these cross-domain conversations. Thanks. There is another question in the chat, uh, which I will read. How do you envision commercialization of the innovations coming out of the DSI that have commercial potential? So I think there was a gentleman on one of the calls yesterday who's that is his office does that. So I would see partnering with that office very closely. Um, we have that issue at my institute now. Uh, it seems like every research team has spun off as a startup company <laughs> uh, to some of them with fabulous success. So I would, I would foresee partnering closely with Wharf and the office that this gentleman was from in order to help facilitate that process. I think Leah, that was D2P and Andy Richards. Thank you, yeah, Andy Richards and D2P, exactly. Great, and another one from the, the chat. Um, Brad Pierce from SSEC says, appreciate the depth of your discussion regarding sovereignty. You also mentioned the need to train the next generation of data scientists and spoke to grads and postdocs. How important is it to reach out to undergrads and high school students, particularly at tribal colleges, 
and yeah. underrepresented groups? Um, so it's absolutely critical. Uh, when I was at the UW, I worked with one of the tribes in Wisconsin. So Steve Ventura, who I think was on this call earlier, <laughs> there he is, uh, and I went up to uh, one of the tribal colleges and taught courses in geospatial technology and satellite remote sensing for the students at the tribal college, as well as tribal government staff members. And then we offered a couple of times uh, some weekend workshops on global positioning systems for the high school students. Um, so I would see much the same here that we definitely should be doing that. I think talking to Eric Wilcots, he mentioned that there is uh, a partnership growing right now that that might be happening on campus. I don't know at this point the role of the DSI on that, unless there might be opportunities for research uh, internships at the DSI. Anyone else uh, with a question? I don't see hands raised, um, but I, I do have a question myself. Um, I was pleased to see at a couple points in, in your presentation uh, mention of ethics and fairness in, um, in data science. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. And in, in particular, I'm thinking about um, uh the 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 bias in um data sets and algorithms that use personal data at, where there are unintended consequences that have serious social implications so do you do you see or how do you see um that aspect um being sort of infused throughout the work of the data science institute from the fundamental work uh, to the applications? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, I would think the campus is going to be developing, uh, you know, through the coursework, right? You have an ethics training. Um, and so I would hope that members of the team would participate in some of that to get some basic understanding, because if they're coming from different locations, they may or may not have the same common understanding of, of what's considered appropriate or responsible uh, within the university. I would, would the, let me turn it back, would the university consider, uh, you know, developing some kind of advisory group or set of guidelines or standards that are university wide that we would adopt? Or would you hope that the DSI helped to frame some of that? Well, that's a good question. I think it's something to explore as we go forward. Um, any other questions? Looks like Florence. Florence, yeah. Um, thanks, Leah. I'm curious of, with respect to your background with working with citizen science and getting that going at a federal level. Can you speak about the um, any issues with respect to participation and demographics and DEI types issues with basically who is more or less willing to participate and volunteer for those kinds of projects? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are two levels. I was working at the level of the science of citizen science. So how do we advance the methodologies? Um, I was not working as much at the level of actually running citizen science projects, although when I was at the university, we did a lot of participatory mapping uh, work. Um, yes, yeah, citizen science at this time is very white and very privileged, you know, highly educated, white and privileged. There is a lot of attention being spent now, particularly through the Citizen Science Association, and how we can increase the diversity within citizen science. Uh, within the federal government, I was working primarily with federal researchers and who was already hired by the federal government. So I didn't have a, a great deal of control over what that compens compens composition was, uh, but we did try to be very broad and inclusive in who participated in the federal community. We didn't turn anyone away who wanted to, to participate. And the first couple of years, I actively pounded the pavement to reach out to as many different departments and agencies, you know, anywhere I could find someone that had the slightest bit of interest, I brought them into the fold. And um, until the group got too big, 
was, you know, regularly touching base with many or all of them. Thank you. Any other hands up? Well, it looks like that uh, brings us to the conclusion of an interesting discussion. And I would like to thank Dr. Shanley one more time. Oh, wait, there's um, one more question. Oh, there is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank it you. said, uh, how would you use your strong federal connections, the UW uh, Federal Relations Office, to strengthen our ability to respond to initiatives with NASA, NOAA, and other governmental agencies? So I have maintained many of my connections to government agencies and with the new administration, many of my former Obama administration colleagues have gone back into government. Uh, so I do have uh, connections that are still fresh in that regard. As a data science institute director, I would be calling them up and touching base, you know, uh, somewhat regularly to understand what's coming down the pike before it hits, if I could. Um, to understand what they were looking for and, you know, get my researchers in front of them uh, so that there was the, those touch points. There's also impact, though, not only the grants, but also on the end of uh, research is having impact, right? So helping um, the researchers and the faculty to present their work to government agencies uh, so that they could have a broader impact with the work that they're doing. Great, thank you. Okay, any more questions coming in? I think Sorry, I like almost... your answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolute. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, thank you once again, Dr. Shanley and um, I hope you enjoy the, the remainder of your virtual visit here at uw Venice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Leah.